Uh, my name is Durwood Shepard. I'm the state standard plans engineer here in central office at the state in the state roadway design office. I sit on a couple of national committees with AASHTO and the Transportation Research Board related to roadside safety. And so it, it wasn't initially something that I thought I was going to end up with the responsibility for. I have a, a strong geotech background, but um, it's funny how, how things work out sometimes. So um, over the last five years, I've, I've really been involved nationally and within the state related to not just guardrail, but all um, roadside safety hardware, you know, all the devices that we consider crashworthy on the roadside. So that's where I was going to kind of start was just going over crashworthiness and, and, and how we determine crashworthiness. And that comes from currently what we refer to as the AASHTO manual for assessing safety hardware or MASH is, is how it will be referred to commonly. This is the, the current crash testing standard that's used to evaluate all roadside safety hardware and determine whether or not the development of it and the research and development side of it constitutes a crashworthy system. Right now, that version is in the 2016 phase and the department is still working on the implementation of this document throughout our standards. So there's still some devices that we use that are, are actually go back to the 1993 version of the crash testing standard, which is referred to as NCHRP Report 350. And so you might hear some of our roadside safety hardware referred to as 350 compliant rather than MASH compliant sometimes, because the vast majority of the installations of roadside safety hardware on the state highway system and still is Report 350 compliant, because you know we've, we've just kind of gotten into within the last couple of years, installing MASH compliant devices through new construction projects. So just for an example, this is a, a crash testing matrix from MASH for the evaluation of an approach terminal. So you can see there's seven different tests here that are used. Um, there's actually a, a eighth one if required, because the way this generally works out with most devices is there's a, sm a small car, as we refer to it, test. There's a pickup truck test. So this is your kind of standard four-door, half-ton pickup truck. But there's also other vehicles, and I'll show some of them in a minute. And then there's sometime there's a, a mid-sized sedan that's used to evaluate these tests. But yeah, as you can see through this matrix, there's a pretty thorough amount of evaluation that's done during the research and development phase of any of this hardware that we use on the roadside. Obviously, these test conditions are, are isolated. They remove as many variables as they can with the goal of trying not only to evaluate you know, crashworthiness as is the end goal, but also to make sure that we're evaluating all devices on the same playing field, so to speak, and that we can make sure that we're comparing everything the same way. Um, with the realization that in the real world, things are a little bit different sometimes. And, and that's what, on the back end, why the department tries to monitor how these devices are performing and if we need to make changes or move to a different product line that we can at certain times. So just a little bit about the actual vehicles that are used in crash testing, with the exception of the, the mid-size sedan that's not shown here, these are pr the primary vehicles that are used for crash testing. You may have heard someone reference to a crash tested device by its test level. And so there's six test levels, test level one through seven. They range in speed and vehicle type within the crash testing. Uh, we don't use a lot of TL1 devices on the state highway system. That's really low speed devices. There's not really a lot in the TL1 category, except for maybe some breakaway system signs. The National Park Service uses some TL1 stuff because they want to be able to use like timber rail elements and things like that within national parks, but you don't see it a lot on the state highway system or even the local system for that matter. But so we do use some TL2 devices within the state. It, it is a lower speed test, a crash test at 43 miles per hour and they use a small car and a pickup truck only to evaluate those, those type systems. 
the bell cow of the department's longitudinal barrier system is, is guardrail. It's considered a TL3 system and it's crash tested at 62 miles an hour using the same small car and, and pickup truck. Uh, moving up, yeah, there's a lot of concrete barrier used on the, the turnpike for sure. And so that's where you step up from guardrail. That's considered a TL4 system. There's some variability in speed once you start climbing and test level. So for instance, for TL4, you run the same TL3 test with a small car and pickup truck at 62 mile an hour, but you add in a single unit truck at 55 mile an hour for MASH. So as you can imagine, that's a lot, a lot of additional weight. The, the center of gravity is much higher, a lot more mass. So those systems have to be um, significantly more robust and, and why you generally see concrete barrier used if you want to achieve a TL4 crash test level. Test level five adds in all of these same TL4 tests with the addition of the tractor trailer, which is, you know, we don't see a lot of TL5 barriers um, throughout the state. There's a few of them used on bridges and in addition to what we call our peer protection barrier. So for some older bridges that we've gotten, you know, underpasses with close proximity to vehicles and we want those older bridges that may have not been designed for impact loads into the piers, um, we install what we call peer protection. Now, again, there is a TL6 and 7, or, or TL6, that starts adding in much larger vehicles, tanker trucks, things like that. There's probably only a handful of installations of those type barriers throughout the entire um, country. So, we don't, we don't spend a lot of time um, discussing those generally. So from here, I'm gonna kind of use a series of videos to explain kind of how guardrail works and some of the nuances to it. Here, uh, just starting out, um, this is actually a, just a crash test video that was used to evaluate um, the older guardrail systems that we used to use that had a 27 inch top rail mounting height and splices of the panels located on the posts. And that was our, our, our primary guardrail system for decades um, throughout the nation. It, it has performed well, so I don't want to imply that through this crash test that we have existing installations out there that don't work well, but when you, we found out through um, reevaluating these systems to mash using larger vehicles um, that are a little bit more representative of the vehicle fleet that we've kind of achieved uh, masses and and vehicle heights that are now reaching the limits of what W beam guardrail can withstand from a capacity standpoint. So they, we started looking at alternative ways to still use the nominal components of W-beam guardrail, but achieve mass compliance. And so that's what you see on the road being installed today. And that's the 31 inch W-beam guardrail system. Um, it's also referred to as MGS, uh, Midwest guardrail system. It was developed at the Midwest roadside safety facility. And so they got to, to earn that moniker um, so what changed here primarily was um, moving the splice of the guardrail to the mid span and shortening the embedment depth of the guardrail sum. And so what that did was where when you have that splice located on a post and the vehicle impacts it, you put a lot of shear stress right into that joint at a post. Whereas if you move the splice to the mid span, you actually put that connection in tension, and that connection is a lot better in tension than it is in shear. So, um, you know, we actually found that if you kind of raise the post out of the ground just four inches, move the, the splice to the mid span, it, it does create a little bit more deflection and flexibility in the system, but it actually allows it to be crash worthy to match. So from here, I'm just going to kind of go over some of the basic um, design elements of guardrail and, and, and how those elements add up to the system being crashworthy. Um, for the most part, 
you know, guardrail is made up of nominal standardized components that you can buy from a variety of different manufacturers or vendors throughout the country. Um, you know, the W beam components, the posts, um, the attachment bolts, all that are just kind of nominal components. Don't necessarily want to call them off the shelf because you're not going to go to your Ace Hardware and find them, but um, they're readily available parts that are that are mass produced, and that's what makes it you know have the economy of mass installation. But some of the components outside of that 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 allow it to be crashworthy, I've already kind of talked about the panel height some um, that plays a part in being able to capture vehicles that have higher centers of gravity. Post performance is a big part of it. And I'll explain all of these in a little bit more detail through the coming slides. Um, length of need, you know, there, there's different ways of looking at need, length of need. Length of need from an engineering design standpoint is the is the value that we determine how far in advance of a hazard that you need to install the guardrail so that you've you've got your your runoff road potential covered. And obviously, people run off the road to part the road much further in advance of the object that they might actually come in contact with. But when we talk about length of need from a crashworthiness perspective, we're also talking about making sure that you have sufficient length and proper anchorage of the system to make sure that it's actually strong enough to capture and redirect a vehicle without it too much of the system detaching or becoming basically kind of useless because you don't have enough strength within the system. Setback is, is an important factor because it, it obviously, when you're talking about guardrail, is a fairly flexible system. It's actually in the industry referred to as a semi-rigid system. Um, when we look at things like high tension cable barrier, that, that's a truly flexible system versus concrete, which is a truly rigid system. But for all intents and purposes, guardrail is fairly flexible. So you got to make sure that you provide sufficient setback behind the face of the guardrail so that when a vehicle impacts it, it doesn't still come in contact with another object that could cause the vehicle to rapidly decelerate or the combination of the two devices, even though they most may be crash worthy in and of themselves, the combination of them wouldn't necessarily lead to a crash worthy outcome or, or you know, anticipated outcome. Um, when, we, when we talk about those setback distances, we don't we used to use the word deflection space but we kind of learned through additional research crash testing and how vehicles were performing on the roadside that you actually got to account not just for the deflection of the barrier system but in some cases you got to actually account for the vehicle intrusion beyond just the deflection of the system with guardrail, that's not as much of an issue because the vehicle pretty much stays in constant contact with it and the, the rail element doesn't generally extend any further than the vehicle does. But you'll see an example in a minute um, that with some other barriers, it's, it's a bigger issue. And so we, we basically refer to that as working with. Um, it's not as much of an understandable term, so we just commonly use the word setback to explain the distance behind there that needs to be free of any above ground objects. Grading is obviously really important. You know, you don't want to have, you know, irregularities in the ground surface or the grading approaching the system or you're going to create instability or changes in momentum in the vehicle that won't allow it to engage the guardrail properly and, and be redirected smoothly. Approach terminals. So, you know, guardrail in and of itself works really great as a length of need system, but on the ends of it, you've got to do something to make those those crash worthy and, and, and ensure that you don't have vehicle compartment intrusions and things like that. The, when you get to the approach terminals, that's when you start stepping away from the nominal standardized type components and you start getting to proprietary components and proprietary systems that are can be somewhat installation sensitive. So you have to be very mindful to install those systems exactly in the ways that the manufacturers um, provide for in their installation manuals. Don't deviate from post types because you can have a pretty dramatic impact on the performance of those systems. And then kind of one of the, the final, I don't want to say final because uh, there's, there's a lot of different options and things that go into a crash-worthy guardrail system and it's almost impossible to cover them all. 
in the amount of time we have here today. But but transitions are another big part of this, and that's where you see us going from two different types of, of barrier systems. You know, where we were trying to merge a W beam guardrail with a concrete bridge rail, for instance. Those things have to be um, specially designed and and installed to make sure that you, when you go from a, a fairly flexible guardrail system that you gradually change the stiffness of that system to where it no longer is, is providing any deflection so that you gradually transition the, the impact zone from a flexible system to a rigid system. So this slide here, this, this video that's playing, um, it kind of, this is almost the crux of how guardrail performs and how it performs correctly. There's a lot, a lot to talk about here and a lot going on. Um, but this is a, a very clean example of exactly how you would expect guardrail to perform in an impact. And so uh, we'll let the video um, play again. But um, what you, some impo very important aspects here are allowing the posts to rotate in the soil. So, so W-beam guardrail is actually considered a strong post system as opposed to a weak post system. And what that means is that you don't want the, the post to yield at the ground line, you want the post to yield in the soil. And that allows the post to completely rotate within the impact zone down and away from the vehicle so it doesn't become a snagging hazard to the vehicle. Along with that, you actually want the guardrail post to release from the panels. That's why having slotted holes in the guardrail panel is very important. So the button head bolts that we use can slip through that slot on an impact, allow the guardrail post to rotate and lay down near the ground surface, but the panels stay up at the original height to to stay in constant contact with the vehicle and provide for that smooth redirection and allow the vehicle to remain upright. Um, if you don't have that disconnect from the panel and the post, then the post could pull the guardrail to the ground and lead to an override type situation. Um, so like I say, this, this is a really good video to just kind of show exactly how these components are supposed to work together to lead to an anticipated crash-worthy outcome with a smooth redirection. So here's an example of a, a crash test that was run in a, a concrete mo strip with, with timber posts. Um, it's kind of a close-up view here, but obviously you can see that the vehicle just penetrates directly through the guardrail. So this is an example of uh, confining the post at the ground line and not not allowing it to rotate through the soil and obviously it just puts too much stress in the guardrail system and it just fractures and the vehicle penetrates straight through it so um you know when we we start trying to look at alternative post types we've got to be very mindful that that post needs to perform similarly to a standard guardrail in soil so that we don't confine it too much or allow it to be too flexible. Um, so my next example here is actually, is something that the, and I apologize for this picture, I couldn't find a bigger, uh, a better resolution picture, but basically what this is showing is an installation with a long run, similar to the department's in case post installation. This is an older guardrail run, but that you can see, and then there could be a couple of different things going on here that led to the the panels laying down the way they did, but it but it is kind of ex explains the concern that we have when we use too many in case posts, and that's because you know the idea behind those posts is to allow for isolated locations where you can't achieve embedment, but if you install too many of them in the wrong conditions, that difference in post rotation behavior could actually lead to the the soil failure being the weakest link it won't allow the post and the panels to detach properly and it just pulls the entire system to the ground as the vehicle overrides it 
So I talked a little bit about length of need a minute ago. Uh, I didn't find a, a great video of a W beam guardrail system with too short of an anchorage, but I think this this test here kind of gets the same point across because it's a freestanding concrete barrier pin and loop system, and and it's the same kind of concept with W beam. If you don't have enough length, then you don't build up enough resistance and tension within the system to allow it to to properly hold on to a vehicle and redirect it so you'd end up with a similar type of result um, most likely it you know this vehicle did at least get somewhat redirected although it was a failed test because it rolled the truck over you know with a uh, guardrail run that was too short the most likely outcome would be that it would just detach the panel from all the posts and the vehicle would just go through the system anyways so I mentioned setback um, earlier. This is the picture I was referring to. Um, again, with a W beam system, like we, we saw with that pickup truck test earlier, the vehicle doesn't really extend any further than the maximum deflection of the guardrail system. But with concrete barrier systems, you can see in this example, because it is so rigid, the vehicles and and it's and it's considered a safety shape with our concrete system. So with our safety shapes what that allows a vehicle to do is slightly climb and lean over the system uh, or the barrier and that helps kind of absorb more of the energy instead of just having a flat vertical wall there and and as a result of allowing a vehicle to slightly climb the barrier and lean over it that's where we get this concept of working width or zone of intrusion is used a lot too to, to describe that occurrence but it kind of gets the point across that you're not just talking about the deflection of the barrier system because in this rigid concrete system here obviously we're getting almost zero deflection but you got to account for that distance beyond it and below it that the the vehicle actually um, extends and that's that's what we refer to as our setback distance proper grading again you know this is is a, a very important element uh, you know i know that we have certain criteria within the department that allow some deviations from this mainly in locations where we're providing guardrail for slightly different justifications than your standard roadside hazard type application so you know you will see certain types of installations where we place the guardrail at, at much further distances and sometimes you might see some sort of drainage swell between it but but those are installed for slightly different reasons but for your your standard guardrail that's installed installed along the shoulder of a roadway it's very important to make sure that the grading leading up to that is is maintained properly and in general doesn't exceed the, the maximums of a, of a one to ten slope and it's also important when it comes to approach terminals that that slope extend beyond the face of it some and to a certain extent behind it so you can see here on this drawing on the bottom we require this this one to ten flat surface to extend from the front post of the last post of the system to six feet before you reach the break point of the shoulder and that's just to make sure that an impacting vehicle still remains flat once it starts engaging the system. A couple of videos here. This was a crash test run at the Midwest Roadside Safety Facility. This is a high-speed TL3 impact test into a standard run of 31-inch guardrail, the, the MGS system. The only difference here is the installation of a six inch high type f curb that's that's what's painted white out here um, at i think it was between either six or eight feet from the face of that guardrail and as you can see in this high speed example at least why you wouldn't want to install curbing in advance of a w beam system just that six inch difference in an approach led to enough rise in the vehicle and change in momentum that the barrier system was no longer able to properly capture and redirect the truck and it resulted in a failed test and a rollover now just to kind of parse that with other types of installations you might see on the state highway system this is a low speed 
um, test, very similar condition, but was run at the 43 mile an hour crash test speed instead of the 62 mile an hour. And you can kind of see that that, that lower speed actually didn't indeed stabilize the vehicle as much. And so we still had a successful test. So that's what allows us to put these types of installations in urban areas with a curving gutter, but while we don't want to see it done on high speed type facilities. So I mentioned the approach terminals a little bit earlier. Again, these are proprietary systems with um, proprietary components. For the most part, um, you know, your approach terminals are developed to provide some sort of attenuation when it is impacted from a vehicle. So this in particular system accomplishes that by extruding the W-beam panel through the extruder head or the impact head that the vehicle comes in contact with and it has a chute in there that flattens the guardrail panels out, as you can see them flailing about there, um, ribbons them out, and through that uh, consumption of en energy from the impacting vehicle allows it to attenuate and bring the vehicle to somewhat more of a controlled um, or at least attenuated stop, and it, and it m more importantly keeps the, the face or the end of the guardrail panel pushed away from the impacting vehicle so it doesn't become a spearing or a penetration hazard to the vehicle. Um, now, one other component of approach terminals that a lot of people don't realize, and it can be seen in this next video, is that our guardrail systems approaches are, are what we consider gating. And what that means is that, you know, obviously because you have to be able to develop enough tension or ribbon strength in the W beam panels, you're not going to get redirective capacity right at the end of the system. So for the most part, all of our W beam approach terminals can't actually provide redirective capacity until you get to at least the third post of the system. So if a vehicle was to impact within the first three posts, it would, as we refer to as gate, it would gate through that system and end up behind it. And that's again is why we require um, the lengths of advancement that you see on guardrail installations out there because as you can see in this video, this is a, a past crash test um, that a vehicle can actually get pretty far along behind or run a guardrail. So you gotta make sure that you still have proper grading um, and run out space behind the guardrail and, and again why you see so much length of advancement on guardrail runs in particular along high speed limited access facilities so what can happen if if these components aren't aren't put together correctly or in some cases a vehicle impacts it at a extremely high rate of speed or in a manner in which they're not evaluated or capable of of, of containing a vehicle you can get a pretty bad outcome. And this is one of the reasons why we strongly discourage the use of alternative post types within approach terminals. And one thing I didn't really show there in my previous slide was showing that we typically consider the approach terminal to be approximately the first 53 feet of a guardrail system. So within that length, it's very important to install those components the way they were crash tested and in the manner in which the installation's instructions tell you do based on what's provided from the manufacturer because if you don't, you know, creating increased stiffness in the system can lead to results like you see on the screen here where the, the guardrail kinks and doesn't extrude properly or becomes a penetration hazard into the vehicle compartment. I mentioned guardrail transitions uh, earlier. This is kind of just a, a picture example of one. This is at the crash testing facility at the Texas Transportation Institute. But I just kind of wanted to, you know, I'm sure you've seen a lot of these installed along the approaches to, to concrete bridge traffic railing. But the whole idea here is that you you can you kind of see where the guardrail posts start getting a lot closer together as you approach the, the concrete. And that just allows the, the system to gradually transition from again a fairly flexible system into a really rigid system these designs can be somewhat temperamental too i think i haven't 
this is one area where I've seen more failed crash tests than, than any other was trying to get approach transitions to meet crash testing standards because achieving that proper amount of of stiffness transition without doing it too quickly where you end up with a pocketing effect where the vehicle ends up engaging the a, a stiffer part of the system too quickly and it decelerates the vehicle too fast. So these can be somewhat temperamental as well. And again, why we don't typically allow alternative post types to be used within transition segments either. So I tried to kind of capture the the big picture of of guardrail and the and the components of it that make it uh, and allow it to work the way that it's supposed to. I guess what the the main thing I was trying to get across was that you know in the example of the installing the curb in front of the guardrail or having unexpected or unanticipated results for the approach terminals that the the system is is fairly nuanced you know that's you know us at central office you know routinely have to engage with consultants to help them determine what is the the best approach to trying to provide a crashworthy system along the roadside because just making what might seem like fairly inconsequential changes to the system to accommodate different constraints on a project can have a pretty dramatic effect on whether or not the system can maintain crashworthiness or not. So, you know, again, that, that was kind of the, the main focus of this was to, to show the components and what a successful test looked like and why it works the way it does, but then also make sure that people understand that that's why we you know, try to make sure that people follow our standards and specifications and design criteria as closely as possible because of those nuanced issues. Again, there's there's a tremendous variety in in options for guardrail installations and and other types of barriers, not not just guardrail, and ways that you can accommodate things and still maintain crashworthiness. Um, if I was to, to to go through all of those different alternatives, you know, we'd be here for a couple of days, and you know we we have some pretty in depth design training out there that goes over some of those alternatives. But even when we've done trainings that lasted an entire day, there's still things that can, can kind of go unsaid. And so again, they're they're fairly nuanced systems that that we encourage they be installed in accordance with the standards as closely as possible. Just wanted to kind of leave you with a, a bit of a safety message too. You know, obviously distracted driving is a is a huge issue throughout the state. It leads to a lot of lane departure crashes. And you know, if we buckle up and put the phone down, we'll have a lot less people running in into guardrail or these systems in the first place that that lead us to have to make some of these hard decisions about determining crashworthiness.